In the heart of the American continent, Central America stands out for its rich cultural diversity and history. This region has long been inhabited by strong indigenous peoples, among which the Aztecs emerged as a powerful nation, establishing a flourishing civilization that deeply influenced surrounding areas. Lake Texcoco, with its strategic location and abundant resources, attracted people from all over. And it was here that the Aztecs chose to settle and build the mightiest empire in the Americas at the time. For many centuries, the Aztecs continuously developed and expanded their realm. They early on mastered the art of building a nation in a highly systematic manner, encompassing governance, society, education, military, and the daily lives of their people. These advancements marked a significant leap forward compared to many contemporary nations or tribes. Additionally, their customs and beliefs were quite unique and somewhat frightening, bearing resemblance to the sacrificial rituals of the Maya, as we've explored in previous episodes. So today, let's delve into and uncover all the secrets of the Aztecs. The Aztecs were a flourishing Mesoamerican culture in central Mexico during the post-classic period from 1300 to 1521. Comprising various ethnic groups in central Mexico, particularly those speaking the Nahuatl language, the Aztecs dominated much of Mesoamerica from the 14th to the 16th century. Aztec culture was organized into city-states, one of which participated in forming political alliances or empires. The Aztec Empire was a federation of three city-states established in 1427. Tenochtitlan, the Mexica or Tenochtitlan city-state, Texcoco, and Tlacopan, formerly part of the Tepanec Empire with dominant power in Azcapotzalco. While the term Aztec is often narrowly applied to the Mexica of Tenochtitlan, it is also widely used to refer to Nahua entities or tribes in central Mexico during the pre-Spanish colonial period, as well as the Spanish colonial period, 1521-1821. Most ethnic groups in central Mexico during the post-classic period shared basic cultural characteristics of Central America, and many distinctive features of Aztec culture cannot be said to be unique to the Aztecs alone. For similar reasons, the concept of the Aztec civilization is best understood as a specific horizon of Central American civilization in general. Central Mexican culture included maize cultivation, social stratification between nobility, Pipilten, and commoners, Macualtan, a pantheon of deities including Tezcatlipoga, Tlaloc, and Quetzalcoatl, and a calendar system of Achupahuali of 365 days intercalated with a Tonalpahuali of 260 days. Particularly for the Mexica of Tenochtitlan, there was the patron deity Huitzilopochtli, double pyramid temples and pottery referred to as Aztec war to IV. From the 13th century, the Valley of Mexico was a densely populated center and the rise of city-states. The Mexica were latecomers to the Valley of Mexico, founding the city-state of Tenochtitlan on unpromising islands in Lake Texcoco, which later became the dominant power of the Aztec Triple Alliance or Aztec Empire. It was an empire that expanded political hegemony far beyond the Valley of Mexico, conquering other city-states across Central America by the end of the post-classic period. Aztec culture and history are primarily known through archaeological evidence found in excavations such as the famous Templo Mayor excavation in Mexico City, from indigenous works, from eyewitness accounts by Spanish conquerors. Important for knowledge of the Nahuas after the conquest was the training of indigenous scribes to write alphabetic texts in Nahuatl, mainly for local purposes under Spanish colonial rule. At its height, Aztec culture had a rich and complex philosophical, mythological, and religious tradition as well as notable achievements in architecture and art. The Aztec Empire was located in the northwest region of present-day Mexico, encompassing vast lands stretching from the Pacific Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico, Fintata. Situated amidst a unique geographical setting, the Aztecs were surrounded by a range of high mountains 
with the formidable Andes to the west and south, while also being endowed with a network of large rivers and lakes, including Lake Texcoco and Lake Xochimilco. The climate of this region is complex, often influenced by climate variability and environmental changes. The area is strongly influenced by the system of the Andes mountain ranges, creating unique climatic conditions, ranging from humid tropical climates in the highlands to humid tropical climates in the lowlands. The geographical features of the Aztec Empire include various types of terrain, from deep valleys and fertile wheat plains to mountain ranges and grassy plateaus. This diverse landscape provided favorable conditions for the development of agriculture and aquaculture, while also presenting challenges in managing and exploiting natural resources. With its diverse climate and terrain, the Aztecs developed a right culture and economy, reflecting profound interaction between humans and the natural environment. This is also evident in their culture and religion, with a respect for an active utilization of natural resources such as Watsi, land and crops. However, environmental and climatic changes also posed significant challenges for the Aztecs, especially in managing water resources and coping with natural disasters and other environmental phenomena. In folk literature from the colonial period, the Aztecs describe their arrival in the Valley of Mexico. The term Aztec, Nahuatl, Aztecas, means people from Aztlan, with Aztlan being a mythical location to the north. Therefore, the term applied to all those who claimed to have heritage from this legendary place. The migration stories of the Mexica tribe tell of their journey alongside other tribes, including the Tlaxcalteca, Tepaneca, and Acolua. But ultimately, their god Huitzilopochtli led them to separate from the other Aztec tribes and take the name Mexica. At the time of their arrival, there were many Aztec city-states in the region, thus Donda. The most powerful states were Colhuacan to the south and Azcapotzalco to the west. The Tepanec city-state of Azcapotzalco expelled the Mexica from Chapultepec. In 1299, King Cocoxli of Colhuacan allowed them to settle in the uninhabited mountain ranges at Tizacar, where they were assimilated into Culhuacan culture. The lineage of Colhuacan traced back to the legendary city of Tula, and by marrying a Colhuacan princess, the Mexica also absorbed this heritage. After living for a time with Colhuacan, the Mexica were again expelled and continued their migration. In Aztec mythology, the city's founders migrated from the mythical cave of Aslan in the desert to the northwest and underwent a lengthy journey that ultimately led them to Lake Texcoco. During this migration, priests carried a giant statue of the god Huitzilopochtli, who whispered directions, giving rise to the name Mexica and promising wealth and prosperity if properly worshipped. Along the way, the Mexica settled in various locations, none of which truly suited their purpose. A decisive event in the migration was a rebellion led by Copil, the son of Malinaxochitl, Huitzilopochtli's sister which was incited to seek vengeance for the mistreatment of the goddess by the Mexica. With Huitzilopochtli's assistance, Copil was slain. The great war god decreed that Copil's heart be thrown as far as possible into Lake Texcoco, and where it landed would indicate where the Mexica should build their new home. The precise location marked by an eagle perched on a prickly pier cactus, devouring a snake. This is exactly what happened and the new capital Tenochtitlan was founded. The Aztec civilization began in the mid-14th century around the area of present-day Mexico City. As a warrior group, the Aztecs primarily served as a mercenary organization and served in the armies of more powerful civilizations. As skilled warriors responsible for service, they became wealthy and began to build their own civilization on the shores of Lake Texcoco which would become their capital, Tenochtitlan. As a governing body, the Aztecs allowed their conquered neighboring states on the shores of Lake Texcoco to maintain autonomy, but they had to pay a hefty tribute each year. Around 1430, the Aztecs grew increasingly powerful, but still regularly paid tribute to the Tepanec civilization, also living on the shores of Lake Texcoco. 
The Aztecs formed an alliance with the Tlacopan and Texcoco civilizations to create the Triple Alliance. They used this alliance to defeat their rivals and gain control of the region, with the Aztecs emerging as the dominant civilization within the group. The Aztec society was highly stratified, where one's social class was largely determined by birth and remained fixed throughout life. There were three main classes in Aztec society, the nobility, the warrior class, and the commoners, which included merchants, artisans, farmers, and slaves. While some individuals could ascend socially through warfare or religious office, such opportunities were limited for the majority. Social mobility for a peasant to climb the ranks was exceedingly rare. At the apex of Aztec, society was the emperor who was treated as a living deity and served accordingly. Below him were the nobles, who managed land and the activities of the peasant class. Nobles also oversaw war taxes and ensured peasants were trained for military service when called upon. All individuals in the Aztec Empire were trained for combat and were expected to be ready for summons when needed. These peasant warriors were rigorously trained and could be mobilized into the Aztec army during campaigns. Through the training of these peasant warriors, the Aztecs could field large armies in battle, a tactic utilized extensively by larger city-states in the region. The warrior class consisted of men whose sole profession was fighting for the empire. In Aztec society, all boys were trained for battle, but relatively few were full-time warriors, with most coming from warrior families. The same was true for the priestly class. Once a child completed their training, it was time for their initiation. At the age of 18, they were allowed to witness their first battle and watch their seniors dispatch some foes. After two battles, lower-ranking warriors were grouped into teams of five to six and tasked with capturing a prisoner of war. If a team returned with a captive, they would commence the first promotion ritual, cutting out the still beating heart and offering it to the god Huitzilopochtli. They would then dismember the body and consume the flesh. The initiates were now officially recognized as warriors and attained the rank of Tlamonic. If they did not return with the prisoner, they would be separated from the army and assigned ordinary tasks. One could rejoin the military a year later and try their luck again. The newly initiated warriors were consolidated into a unit called Ikuexticatl, comprising around 400 men from the same district or village. Promotions from this point onward were based on individual merit. Prisoners of war were sacrificed alive on a table atop one of the many pyramids. Nearly all captured men were sacrificed and about one-four of the women shared the same fate. Those spared became slaves or concubines after capturing a second prisoner, they were promoted to Cuetecatl. This rank allowed warriors to wear a special black and red outfit called Tlaukistli, Don Sandals and Don a Conical Hat. Capturing a third prisoner granted them command over a unit and a banner shaped like a butterfly, the insignia of a priest, to be worn on their back as a badge of rank. Capturing a fourth prisoner or more would earn them the rank of Cuauhtlacoatl and they would be admitted into a military order, like the Eagle or Jaguar Knights. As outlined above, the Aztec warrior groups were divided into ranks with the military associations, being Eagle and Jaguar, symbols of strength and bravery. These warriors were considered the noblest class in society, equipped with atletals, bows, spears, and daggers, as well as wearing special armor representing Eagles and Jaguars, adorned with feathers and jaguar skins. Physical strength and courage on the battlefield were essential factors in achieving this rank. Commoners who reached the ranks of eagle or jaguar were honored and received many privileges similar to nobles. They were granted land, allowed to drink a royal brew called pulka, adorned with expensive jewelry, required to dine at the palace, and could take concubines. They also tied their hair with red cords adorned with green and blue feathers. Eagle and Jaguar knights were accompanied by Pochteca, protectors and guardians of the city, even serving as bodyguards to the king, with reverence to Heitzilopochtli and Tezcatlipoca. 
Special forces and elite units were known as Otomies and the Shorn Ones. Otomies inherited their name from the original settlers of the Valley of Mexico. These individuals were provided with a full body outfit in green, red or blue with a banner behind symbolizing their heroism. They carried a beautifully crafted maquahuitl and a variety of shields while their hair was tied on top with a red tuft. The Shorn Ones, on the other hand, were the Emperor's Officer Corps. They wore Tlawistli, a uniform reserved for officers, and shaved their heads except for a single lock of hair on the left side. Both organizations were open only to the nobility and received specialized training in strategy, logistics, and diplomacy. These warriors had to fight on the front lines to maintain their power and command authority. The Aztecs believed that the world consisted of 13 celestial layers and nine layers above the earth, each with its own gods. In their belief, the sun represented the source of life, and those living in central Mexico were considered the people of the sun because this region was closest to the sun. According to Aztec mythology, the world was initially in a state of chaos and darkness until the divine couple Tanaka Quijuatl and Tanaka Teuctli also known as two different aspects of the god Omiteotl, were born, representing good and evil, light and darkness, fire and water, judgment and forgiveness, they gave birth to four sons. Tlaloc, the god of rainstorms, Huitzilopochtli, the sun and martial arts god, Quetzalcoatlan, the god of wind, Metezcatlipoca, the god of the night, of magic. And after 600 years, the offspring of these two gods began to create the universe and all the other gods, including the creation of the sun. The Aztecs believed that the sun was the source of energy that sustained life in the universe. However, despite the sun always shining, its energy was not infinite. When the sun's energy was depleted, the earth would plunge into destruction but then be reborn. To ensure this rebirth, a god would volunteer to sacrifice themselves by jumping into the sacrificial fire. The story of the gods building the world went through many upheavals as the sun was created, multiple times only to be destroyed again. The first sun was created by the god of the night, Tezcatlipoca, who volunteered to jump into the fire to create it. And from the ashes of the god, the gods created giants who only ate acorns to live. Until the god Quetzalcoatl, the god of wind, got angry, hit Tezcatlipoca out of the sky and was pushed from the sky. Quetzalcoatl, in anger, sent jaguars to eat all the giants. Thus, the first sun cycle officially ended after the destruction of the first sun. The wind god Quetzalcoatl then became the second sun or the wind sun, recreating the world and creating normal-sized humans who only knew how to eat corn. Everything seemed fine until humans began to change. They became cruel, corrupt. They stopped showing proper respect to the gods and this was the time for the god Tezcatlipoca to take revenge. He disguised himself as a sorcerer and used dark magic to curse all the evil people into monkeys. Witnessing that scene, Quetzalcoatl was also saddened and left the sun, turning into a great storm, sweeping away all the people or monkeys from the earth. So the second cycle officially ended. After Quetzalcoatl abandoned the sun, the rain god Tlaloc became the third sun, and thus this sun is also called the rain sun. At this time, the god Quetzalcoatl had also created a new race of people. And thanks to the rain, this world continued to flourish and humans could sow corn seeds by themselves. It can be said that this is a happy and prosperous world. However, the god Tezcatlipoca once again became a troublemaker. He seduced the wife of Tlaloc and took her away to a place no one knew. Too saddened by the betrayal of his wife, Tlaloc forgot the duties of a god. He shone like the sun but refused to rain and ignored everyone's pleas. So a terrible drought swept across the earth killing many people. And finally in anger at the constant pleading, then Tlaloc also gave a heavy rain. However, instead of saving people, it killed more people and didn't stop there. Then the god tried to add a rain of fire to destroy the world. And the third sun cycle lasted 364 years, ending in a barren earth. The gods then also built a completely new earth from the ashes. The successor to the title of the fourth sun was the sister of the predecessor Tlaloc, the goddess of water Chalchiutlikue. 
In this era, humans began to learn to plant corn to support themselves. However, once again the god Tezcatlipoco was the one who destroyed everything. Both the people and Chalchiutlicu felt sad when he blasphemed the goddess that she didn't really love humans and only showed mercy when praised. Chalkayutlikuikuki was also so heartbroken that she cried blue for the next 50 years and caused a terrible flood, drowning all the people grieving on the earth. Unable to accept the sight of humans being destroyed again by Tezcatlipoca, the god Quetzalcoatl went into hell to steal the bones of the dead from the underworld ruler Mictlantecutli. And then with magic in his own blood, the god resurrected humans again, under the light and the fifth sun. Finally, the world we are living in corresponds to the fifth sun, which is the shaking sun. This is the newest cycle still ongoing, and also the only cycle to the sun having movement across the sky. In this cycle, there will be two gods competing with each other to become the sun. That is Tekchistikatl and Nanahuatzin by the production of the gods, but for both of them to jump into the fire leading to now, the universe has up to two suns. The world is too bright and the, the other gods support that Nanahuatzin threw a white rabbit into the face of this god Tekiztecatl, making this sun dimmed into the moon, and also because it is too weak. So the gods also have to continuously shed blood for this sun to be able to maintain existence. And the Aztecs believed that every disaster happened was a sign that the sun was running out of energy and the gods were not strong enough to bleed. And every time like this, the Aztecs had to perform a living sacrifice ceremony to be able to contribute more energy to the sun and extend the existence of this universe. Unable to accept the sight of humans being destroyed again by Tezcatlipoca, the god Quetzalcoatl went into hell to steal the bones of the dead from the underworld ruler Mictlantecutli. And then, with magic and his own blood, the god resurrected humans again under the light and the fifth sun. Finally, the world we are living in corresponds to the fifth sun, which is the shaking sun. This is the newest cycle still ongoing and also the only cycle to the sun having a movement across the sky. In this cycle, there will be two gods competing with each other to become the sun. That is Tekkistakatl and Nanawatsan by the production of the gods, but for both of them to jump into the fire, leading to now the universe has up to two suns. The world is too bright, and the other gods support that Nanawatsin threw a white rabbit into the face of the god Texistacatl, making this sun dimmed into the moon, and, and also because it is too weak. So the gods also have to continuously shed blood for this sun to be able to maintain existence, and the Aztecs believed that every disaster happened was a sign that the sun was running out of energy, and the gods were not strong enough to bleed, and every time like this the Aztecs had to perform a living sacrifice ceremony to be able to contribute more energy to the sun and extend the existence of this universe. Did you know that Aztec artists were often paid with items such as textiles, beans, pepper, cacao, and heaps of maize? The upper class in Aztec society owned the majority of artworks. In fact, many noble families wore colorful clothing and jewelry, including bracelets and necklaces. Legend has it that Emperor Montezuma II never wore the same outfit, twice. The Aztecs created various forms of art, including jewelry, knives, pottery, sculptures, and mosaics. Mosaic art consisted of paintings or patterns created from small pieces of materials. The Aztecs used a sacred mineral called turquoise to create their mosaics. They also utilized coral, shell, and obsidian, a volcanic glass-like stone. Masks were also significant to the Aztecs, with many masks featuring mosaics. Masks were used for decoration, ceremonies, as well as after death. These masks often symbolized one of the Aztec deities and were worn or placed in temples by priests. And what do you think was the most common form of Aztec art? Featherwork. Featherwork originated from the Aztecs, and artists who created featherwork were highly esteemed. Feathers from exotic birds, including quetzals, long-tailed parrots, and parakeets, were woven together to create feather mosaics, cloaks, and headdresses. Only the nobility and the wealthy could wear featherwork in Aztec society. Artistic themes, leopard, rattlesnake, dog, eagle, and flycatcher. The Aztecs revered animals and used them as symbols in their art. 
These symbols often represented Aztec deities. Frogs signified joy, while monkeys symbolized dance and celebration. The eagle symbolized warrior, the Dombrian with that fly Kichir was a symbol of the Tzomankard, and Truid, famous Aztec art. Can you imagine discovering a lost Aztec calendar? The Aztec sunstone was found beneath Mexico City in 1790. It had been lost for 300 years. The calendar is 12 feet in diameter, or the length of two men. It was carved from basalt, a hard volcanic rock that helped us understand the Aztec gods. Another great discovery is the Aztec feathered shield. The shield was covered in a layer of featherwork. It is believed to depict a green grasshopper in the middle. Architecture. Like modern society, the Aztecs built and designed buildings to serve various purposes. However, without modern tools, their achievements would be incredibly impressive, especially as the land around Aztec cities was very marshy and therefore not optimal for construction. So most of their innovations involved creating artificial islands. The Aztecs were heavily influenced by the earlier civilization of the Toltecs, a civilization that flourished in the same region from the 900s to 1100s. The Aztecs inherited cultural aspects from the Toltecs, including the Nahuatl language and their architectural prowess. Like the Toltecs, the Aztecs constructed religious, familial, and entertainment spaces. They also laid out their cities in a grid-like fashion, not unlike modern constructions in cities like New York and Chicago. While the houses of the Aztecs, especially those of the poor, tended to be simple, public structures such as temples to the Aztec gods were colossal constructions filled with detail and craftsmanship. The Aztecs designed their cities around a central plaza, with the most important buildings adjacent and further away from the plaza were houses and agricultural land. Overall, the cities were colorful and adorned with artistic symbols to demonstrate their reverence for their gods. For example, Aztec buildings featured eagles and snakes, both of which had religious significance. Building materials varied from wood for residential homes to volcanic rock for important temples. Aztec temples. The most famous example of Aztec architecture is the temples built for their many gods. These temples were built in a pyramid-like style with several brightly painted tiers symbolizing different deities. Religious symbols carved into stone were also common. The Aztecs infused every aspect of their temple architecture with symbolism to honor their gods. The tops of the temples included wide, flat spaces for the worship of the main deities and featured a statue of the deity, as well as decorated walls and sacrificial altars. The most famous architectural feat among these is the Templo Mayor, the center of the city of Tenochtitlan. Records of the temple, mainly from the Spanish conquest, show a great example of considering themes in Aztec design. First built in the mid-1400s, the Templo Mayor was constructed from wood, rebuilt, and expanded with stone many times throughout its long history. By the time of the Spanish conquest, it stood 180 feet tall. The Aztecs considered the entire architectural space around the temple to be sacred. The Mayor's Temple had a special procession avenue and a long staircase leading to the twin temples on top of the pyramid dedicated to rain and war gods. When worshippers built the temple facing east, the rising sun could be clearly seen between the two temples on the equinox, showing the Aztec respect for the sun and their use of symbolism in their architecture. This was also evident in how the rain god was associated with mountains, leading some historians to suggest that the pyramid itself was considered a tribute to this god as it was an artificial mountain. The Aztecs built their temples to be closer to the divine and to have a place to offer their many sacrifices. Aztec priests regularly performed blood rituals, but this civilization is best known for its frequent use of human sacrifice. The Aztec gods needed to be constantly appeased through sacrificial rituals, which included killing captured male and female prisoners of war, as well as the children of prominent citizens, considered extremely valuable sacrifices. The requirements varied depending on the needs of the specific deity. The architecture of the temple served its purpose when the bodies of the victims were brought down the pyramid to the statue of a goddess that other gods in Aztec mythology had thrown from her position. Aztec homes. 
While Aztec homes tend to be overlooked due to the allure of temple architecture, these architectural works were also impressive at the time. The palace of the Aztec emperor, of course, was the best place to live, with many rooms decorated in gold and carvings as signs of the leader's prominence. They were often used to show reverence and request favor from the emperor. Other nobles, including priests, also had homes, decorations, and elaborate artworks. In contrast, wood and fired brick were the primary building materials for the homes of the middle class. The roofs were made of thatch or other modest materials. These dwellings typically consisted of one room and had a separate space for the family's worship. Near these homes were the famous shinampas, or floating gardens built on the lake, tended by lower class people. These gardens demonstrated an impressive ability to use space because they took advantage of marshy areas and encouraged the development of irrigation systems to bring water to the city. Daily life and the economy typical life. The wealthy lived in houses made of stone or sun-dried brick. The emperor of the Aztecs resided in a grand palace with numerous rooms and gardens. All wealthy individuals had private baths, similar to sauna or steam rooms, and bathing was an essential part of daily life for the Aztecs. The poor lived in small huts with one or two rooms and thatched roofs made of palm leaves. They had gardens near their homes for growing vegetables and flowers. The interior of their homes had four main areas, a sleeping area with mats on the floor, a cooking area, a dining area, and a space for worshiping the gods. Family structure was crucial for Aztecs, with the husband typically working outside the home as a warrior, farmer, or artisan, while the wife took care of household chores. Family and marriage Aztec society had a patriarchal system, meaning the oldest man in the family usually managed household affairs and made most final decisions. Everyone in the family obeyed the supreme authority of the clan chief and his rule. For most people, daily life in Aztec society was orderly and secure. Marriage was compulsory in the Aztec Empire. Girls married around the age of 15 and boys a few years later around 20. Aztec marriages were arranged by elders. After marriage, the couple lived with the husband's family. Aztec marriages were not based on love, but on alliances and family friendships. Women held significant power in Aztec society compared to many other places worldwide at that time. Women could own and inherit personal property, practice medicine, and work as educators. While not considered equal in society, they could earn respect through self-education. However, this path to respect was not available to all peasant classes, except for the luckiest and most intelligent girls. Aztec culture, the life of the Aztecs centered around agriculture and warfare. Aztecs continually strengthened their power through war, which largely shaped their overall culture. The majority of Aztecs were simple, safe, and stable farmers. Aztec farmers had access to a more diverse range of foods than most European farmers. They also had the freedom to produce and trade goods without significant government intervention. Aztec farmers were the backbone of Aztec society and, while not equal to the upper class, they were not treated poorly either. Their labor was essential for the smooth functioning of society, and as long as they worked, the Aztec aristocracy seemed not to interfere much in their lives. Clothing Aztec men wore loincloths and long capes, while women wore dresses and long tunics. Poor people often wove their fabrics and made their clothes, with the responsibility of clothing falling to the wife. There were social rules about clothing, including detailed laws governing the decoration and colors of clothing that different classes could wear. For example, only the nobility could wear clothes decorated with feathers, and only the emperor could wear a turquoise-colored cloak. Food to the main staple in the Aztec diet was processed similarly to corn. They ground corn into flour to make corn cakes. Other essential food items included beans and squash. Besides these three main staples, the Aztecs ate various foods such as insects, honey, and snakes. Perhaps the most valuable food item was cocoa beans, used to make chocolate. Suritionur Famal Aztec children were required by law to attend school, including slaves and girls. 
The only exception at this time in history was when they were very young and being taught by their parents. When they reached adolescence, both boys and girls attended separate schools. Girls learned about religion, including ceremonial songs and dances, as well as cooking and sewing. They also learned how to farm or practice crafts, such as pottery or leatherworking. They were also taught about religion and warfare, similar to the male warriors. Children in Aztec society were educated early on about proper behavior, and it was crucial for Aztec children not to complain, mock the elderly, or interrupt punishments for rule violations. Most importantly, Aztec children were taught not to complain, mock the elderly, or interrupt punishments for rule violations. Serious offenses could result in death, such as being sacrificed with chocolate, originating from the Aztecs. The name of the ball game Malamemalitzli comes from the Aztec word yuli, meaning rubber. Sons of nobles attended a separate school where they learned advanced skills, such as writing laws and techniques. Students at these schools were treated more harshly than those in regular schools, and slaves could escape from slavery. Games Aztecs enjoyed playing games, and one of the most popular was the board game called Patali. Similar to many contemporary board games, players moved their game pieces around the board by rolling dice. Another common game was Ula Malitsi, a ball game played with a rubber ball in a court. Players had to pass the ball around using their hips, shoulders, heads, and knees. Some historians believe that this game was used to prepare for war, as older family members were cared for, diligently and respected in Aztec society. Punishments for violating laws related to clothing were often severe and could include execution. Chocolate, originating from the Aztecs, was a significant part of their culture. The name of the ball game, Ulamolitzli, comes from the Aztec word yuli, meaning rubber. Sons of nobles attended a separate school where they learned advanced skills, such as writing lays and techniques. Students at these schools were treated more harshly than those in regular schools, and slaves could escape from slavery. Agriculture. The Aztecs were skilled farmers and their farming methods are still used today. Aztec farmers exploited every piece of land available for cultivation. Aztec villagers built terraces to turn hillsides into fields and irrigated crops. Aztec farmers had ambitious goals for crop production to the extent that they even created floating islands called chingnampas on giant reed rafts in the middle of lakes. Aztec farmers grew all kinds of crops, including tomatoes, beans, squash, peppers, and maize. The most valuable crop grown by the Aztecs to this day is cotton. Cotton was crucial to the Aztecs. Their warriors wore thick cotton armor, and the nobility wore dyed and adorned cotton garments. However, Surprisingly, cotton was not the most expensive commodity in the Aztec world. Colorful feathers were the most luxurious trade item of the Aztec world. For the Aztecs, feathers were more important than gold. Nobles wore feathers as a symbol of wealth and very few commoners could afford them. Trade. Considering what the Aztecs did daily, people in Aztec society engaged heavily in trade. Handicrafts produced at one end of the empire could be found in the house of a farmer at the other end of the empire. Almost every farmer participated in crafting goods for the local market. Aztec farmers had access to almost every type of commercial goods that the nobility could access. Farmers produced goods for trading to increase income. Dior. As the Aztec empire developed, land resources shrank and farmers earned more significant income from trading goods than from agriculture. Among the most common trade items were obsidian, used for knife blades, cotton fabric, for clothing and wearing, and pottery. Of course, perishable goods such as food were also exchanged. The Aztecs had no wheeled vehicles or draft animals, so all traded goods were transported by people or boats. As a result, the Aztecs built a vast network of roads for relatively easy travel. However, due to the lack of animals for carrying loads, it is surprising that pottery was traded so widely because of its weight. In fact, pottery was traded from one end to the other of the empire, and even the poor seemingly owned both imported pottery and domestically produced pottery. Trade seemed to be something that the state did not intervene in. 
Because of this, most farmers created commercial goods as a way to earn extra income. One third of a farmer's agricultural products were confiscated by the state, so farmers had to diligently find other ways to provide for themselves as well as the state. Slaves were also traded throughout the empire. An Aztec slave could be a prisoner of war, but was more likely to be caught stealing, a serious offense in the Aztec world, or someone who gambled until they had to sell themselves into slavery. A slave in the Aztec empire had almost the same rights as everyone else except that they had to work for their owner. A slave could marry, own property, and operate a business. In the heart of the green Mexican Valley, the Aztec Empire flourished, bringing with it extremely rich and diverse rituals and festivals. With their deep religion and unique culture, the Aztecs built a ritual system with the purpose of honoring the gods, maintaining the balance of the world, and commemorating important events in history and culture. Crops. Their brilliant festivals, sacred rituals, and colorful traditions create a rich and unique cultural picture of the Aztecs captivating people and recalling a glorious age past. The Aztecs were famous for using blood for sacrifices in religious rituals and social events. In Mesoamerican culture, human sacrifice was regarded as a repayment for the sacrifices that the gods themselves made when creating the world and the sun. This idea of reciprocity is particularly evident in the legend of the reptilian monster, Tzipactli, or Tlaltecutli, the great gods Quetzalcoatl and Tezcatlipoca tore this creature apart to create the earth and the sky, with all other elements such as mountains, rivers, and springs stemming from various parts of her body. To soothe Hayakli's spirit, the gods promised to appease her heart and human blood. From another perspective, sacrifice served as recompense for the sins committed by humans in Aztec mythology. The gods were then fed and nourished with the blood and flesh of sacrifices to ensure the continuous balance and prosperity of Aztec society. Bloodletting and self-mutilation, such as bleeding from the ears and limbs using bone or maguey spines, and burning strips of blood-soaked paper were common forms of sacrifice as were the burning of tobacco and incense. Other types of sacrifice included offering live animals such as deer, butterflies, and snakes. In a sense, sacrificed offerings, valuable objects willingly relinquished to the gods for their enjoyment, encompassed food and precious items made of metals like gold, jade, and shell that might be buried ceremonially. The primary rationale for human sacrifice among the Aztecs was fundamentally a matter of survival. According to Aztec cosmology, the sun god Huitzilopochtli waged an eternal battle against darkness, and if darkness were to prevail, the world would end. To keep the sun moving across the sky and preserve their lives, the Aztecs believed they had to nourish Huitzilopochtli with human hearts and blood. It's hard to fathom, but many Aztec soldiers, slaves, and citizens were willingly brought to the sacrificial altar. Offering one's heart to Huitzilopochtli was a great honor, and a ticket to a fortunate afterlife, fighting alongside the sun god's army against the forces of darkness. When the Aztecs sacrificed humans to Huitzilopochtli, the victims would be placed on a sacrificial stone. Don't then, a priest would cut open their chests with an obsidian or flint neva. The heart would be torn while still beating and healed up to the sky to honor the sun god. The body would then be pushed down the pyramid where the stone of Koyolshoki lay. The Koyolshoki stone reenacted the story of Koyolshoki, Huitzilopochtli's sister, who was dismembered at the foot of a mountain, similar to sacrificial victims. The body would be either cremated or given to the warrior responsible for capturing the victim. He would either dismember the body and distribute the pieces as offerings or use them for the cannibalistic rituals. Thus, the warrior would rise in the hierarchical system of Aztec society, a system that rewarded successful warriors. In this regard, flesh would be burned, or blood poured onto the statues of the gods, so that they could directly consume the offerings. 
Perhaps the most quintessential example of feeding the gods was the ceremonies aimed at ensuring that the sun god Tezcatlipoca was adequately nourished to have the strength to awaken the sun every morning. Another form of sacrifice was the ceremonial ball game, where the losing team captain, or even the entire team, would pay dearly for their failure. Particularly, children could be sacrificed to honor the rain god Tlaloc in ceremonies held atop sacred mountains. Many children would be severely wounded before death, as Tlaloc demanded the tears of children as part of the sacrifice. Priests made the children cry on the way to the pyre, a sign that Tlaloc would wet the earth in the rainy season. Slaves were another societal group from which sacrificial victims were chosen. They might accompany their rulers in death or be offered as sacrifices to ensure prosperity and trade. Among the most esteemed sacrificial victims were those impersonating divine beings. Specially selected individuals would dress as a specific deity before sacrifice. In the case of impersonating Tezcatlipoca in the ceremony of Tocatl, May or June in the Aztec solar calendar, the victim would be treated like royalty for a year before the sacrifice, taught by priests, provided with a female companion, and honored with dances and flowers. The victim was the earthly embodiment of the god until the final brutal moment when he met his creator. Perhaps worse off were those impersonating Zipe Totec who reached the climax of the festival Tlacacaxi Pehualistli, where they were skinned to honor the god known as the Flayed One. Human sacrifice also served another purpose in the expanding Aztec Empire of the 15th and 16th centuries, namely intimidation. The mass killing rituals and the display of severed heads on a grand scale served as vivid reminders of the empire's power and extent of its dominance. DNA analysis of victims found at the Templo Mayor site shows that the majority of those sacrificed were outsiders, likely soldiers or slaves of enemies. The nature of warfare in the Aztecs' apex of power in the late 15th century was also unique. By the late 15th century, the Aztecs had gained control over vast territories in central and southern Mexico. The only holdout was the neighboring city-state of Tlaxcala to the east. With human sacrifice, victims were often chosen from captive warriors. Indeed, wars were often conducted with the sole purpose of providing candidates for sacrifice. This was termed flowery war, Sotiao Yodel, in which indecisive skirmishes resulted from the Aztec's satisfaction with merely capturing, capturing enough prisoners for sacrifice until its Kala was a favorite hunting ground. The most valiant or handsome fighters were deemed the most worthy candidates for sacrifice and were likely to appease the gods more. When dead human sacrifice, especially for the most deserving victims, was considered a high honor, a direct communion with the divine. Conducted at specialized temple sites atop large pyramids, such as in Tenochtitlan, Texcoco and Tlacopan, Sacrifice was often performed by hoisting the victim onto a special sacrificial stone, cutting open the chest, and extracting the heart with an obsidian or flint knife. The most common form of human sacrifice was heart extraction. The heart would then be placed in a stone vessel called quaxicoli, or in a shakmol, a stone statue carved with a receptacle in the abdomen, and burned as an offering to the sacrificed god. Additionally, victims could be decapitated or dismembered. This method was often reserved for female victims impersonating deities like Shalcutlik, but illustrations recorded by the Spanish in various codecs depict decapitated bodies being thrown down the tiers of the pyramid. Victims sacrificed to sheep totec were also skinned, likely to mimic the shedding of seeds. Before the ritual took place, there were rules for the chosen ones, such as fasting for four or multiples of four days before each ceremony. During these fasting periods, there would be one meal without condiments, like chili or salt, once a day. Abstinence from sexual relations, bathing, etc., would also be observed. Each ceremony required offerings of incense, food, flowers, paper, clothing with rubber being spread, and incense and wine poured. 
The ceremony itself involved feasting, dancing, parading, and singing ritual songs accompanied by music from drums, rattles, flutes, trumpets, and shell horns. The victim might also be subjected to a more elaborate procedure in which a single victim was required to engage in gladiatorial combat against a team of carefully selected warriors. Naturally, the victim had no chance of surviving this ordeal or even inflicting any injury on the opponent, as he was not only bound to a Tamalacandle stone bench, but his weapon was often a feathered club, while his opponent had obsidian-edged swords as vicious as scalpels. In another method, the victim might be tied to a frame and shot with arrows or darts, and perhaps the worst method, the victim would be continuously thrown into the fire and then have their heart cut out. The priests would then take the bodies to another ceremonial space where they would be laid out. With years of practice, detailed anatomical knowledge and knives sharper than modern surgical steel, they would skillfully slit a path between the vertebrae and the neck, expertly severing the body's head. Using sharp knives, the priests would deftly peel away the facial skin and muscles, turning it into a skull box. They would then drill large holes on both sides of the skull box and place it on a thick wooden pole to hold other skull boxes prepared similarly. The trophy heads would be tied to Tenochtitlan's Tsompantli, a colossal skull rack erected in front of the Templo Mayor, a pyramid with two shrines at the top. One was dedicated to the god of war, Huitzilopochtli, and the other to the rain god Tlaloc. Finally, after months or even years exposed to the elements, the skull boxes would start to disintegrate, losing teeth and perhaps even the jaw. The priests would remove them to fashion into a mask and place in the offering, or use mortar to add them to the two skull towers at either end of the Tzampantli. For the Aztecs, a larger cultural group to which the Mexica belonged. Those skull boxes were seeds, ensuring the continuous existence of humanity. They were symbols of life and rebirth, akin to the first flowers of spring. Various forms of human sacrifice expressed reverence for different gods and killed victims in different ways. Victims might be shot with arrows, die in gladiatorial combat, be sacrificed in Mesoamerican-style ball games, burned, flayed after sacrifice, or drowned. Individuals who failed to complete their ritual duties would be dealt with in a much less honorable manner. This offense to the gods needed to be atoned for, so the sacrificial offerings would be killed while being punished instead of being honored. For the Aztecs, human sacrifice was a normal way of showing reverence to the divine. However, this practice is now seen as a gruesome ritual that claimed the lives of hundreds, if not thousands, in a terrifying manner. Harvest festivals and ceremonies honoring the gods and heroes of the Aztec people are among the most important events of the year, marking the end of one season and the beginning of a new cycle. These occasions serve not only to pay homage to the gods and spirits, but also as opportunities for the community to come together, celebrate, and share joy after a season of hard work in the fields. Before the festivals take place, the entire Aztec community eagerly participates in preparing and decorating for this significant event. Priests and religious leaders oversee the construction of temples and sacred altars, along with adorning them with fruits, flowers, and various types of foliage. In the days leading up to the festival, families also begin to prepare foods and drinks for the ceremony, ranging from traditional dishes to special delicacies reserved for this occasion. Artisans also create elaborate, and unique costumes for people to wear during the festivities. The formal ceremony begins with prayers and offerings at the temples and sanctuaries. Priests and religious leaders lead the community in prayers and offerings to the gods and spirits. Sacrifices include offering gifts such as food, wine, and fruits, as well as performing Aztec ritual sacrifices. The gods and spirits are honored through elaborate and solemn ceremonies attracting their protection and blessings for a bountiful harvest season. After the ceremonial part, the harvest festival officially begins with a combination of music, singing, dancing, and traditional games. The entire community participates in these activities, from children to the elderly, creating a lively and joyful atmosphere. Dance troops and music groups perform magnificent artistic displays, ranging from traditional dances 
to modern performances combined with rhythmic beats and melodies. Contests and games also take place everywhere, from horse races to archery and wrestling. The beliefs and rituals of the Aztec people constitute an integral and intricate part of their culture and religion. This not only reflects a profound interaction between humans and nature, but also highlights the values, beliefs, and perspectives on the universe that the Aztecs grounded their lives and existence upon. Below is an insightful look into the characteristics of Aztec beliefs and rituals. Aztec beliefs encompass a diverse system of gods and spirits, each with distinct powers and influences over specific aspects of life and nature. These gods are revered and supplicated through ceremonies and sacrifices in hopes of attracting their protection and blessings. For example, Huitzilopochtli, the god of war and protection, is regarded as the guardian deity of the Aztec Empire and is often honored through sacrificial rituals. Quetzalcoatl, the god of education and the arts, is venerated through ceremonies of learning and knowledge dissemination. Aztec beliefs reflect a profound understanding of the natural cycles and the cycle of life after death. For the Aztecs, the natural world is an inseparable part of life and existence, with each of its manifestations considered sacred and venerable. Life after death is seen as part of a cycle of regeneration and the continuation of life. The souls of the departed are believed to reside in the underworld, and honoring and praying for them is an essential part of Aztec rituals and beliefs. While Aztec beliefs demonstrate respect and reverence for the natural world and the gods, they also reflect hope and optimism for the future. The Aztec community believes that honorings and praying to the gods will bring them protection and favor, enabling them to thrive and prosper. Additionally, these beliefs provide the Aztecs with a perspective on the world and life, helping them overcome challenges and hardships in their daily lives. The belief in resurrection and the continuity of life after death also instills patience and optimism in facing life's adversities. The Aztec Empire, a formidable power dominating central Mexico in the 15th and early 16th centuries, controlled a capital that was one of the largest in the world. Its Coatl, hailed as the leader of the Aztecs in 1427, negotiated what is now known as the Triple Alliance, a powerful political alliance of Tenochtitlan, Texcoco, and Tlacopan. Consolidated from 1428 to 1430, this alliance strengthened the Aztec leadership, making them the dominant Nahua group in a vast region spanning central Mexico and extending into present-day Guatemala. However, Tenochtitlan still faced decline after the siege and destruction of the city by the Spanish in 1521 under the leadership of Hernando Cortes. How did Cortes overthrow the Aztec Empire? Hernando Cortes was a Spanish nobleman who grew up in an aristocratic family. In 1502, Cortes embarked on a journey to the New World with Nicolás de Ovando, hoping this exploration would help him establish his career. In the following years, Cortes participated in several expeditions to conquer new territories such as Cuba. While stationed in Cuba, he persuaded Governor Diego Velázquez to allow him to lead an expedition to Mexico. Eager to seize new lands for the Spanish crown, convert the indigenous people to Christianity, and plunder the region for golden riches, Cortes organized his own expeditionary force consisting of 100 sailors, 11 ships, 508 soldiers, and 16 horses. He set sail from Cuba on the morning of February 18, 1519 to begin his unauthorized expedition to Central America. Arriving on the Yucatan coast, Cortes encountered local natives who informed him about other Europeans who had been attacked and captured by the local Maya people. Cortes rescued Geronimo de Aguilar, a Franciscan friar, from the Maya and enlisted Aguilar as one of his crew members. Aguila became invaluable to Cortes as he was fluent in the local Mayan language. With Aguilar's assistance, Cortes conquered and battled indigenous groups along the way. Cortes and his men later acquired another asset when an Aztec captain gifted them about 20 young Maya women who had been enslaved, including Malinali, a Nahua woman from the Gulf Coast of Mexico. Malinali was baptized with the name Marina and later called La Malinche. 
La Malinche spoke both Aztec and Maya languages to work alongside the Spanish invaders, providing them with the ability to communicate with any native groups they encountered. With La Malinche and Aguilar in tow, Cortes, at the Totonac coast, learned that there was an emperor, further inland, who controlled a land called Mexico, the northern region of Yucatan and Tabasco. Cortes decided that he was the person he needed to meet to settle matters. The Spaniards knew that the emperor lived in Tenochtitlan, a city built on an island in the middle of a large lake. The only way to enter the city was through one of three causeways paved with stone. Each causeway had gaps for boats to pass through and drawbridges to cross. The king's name was Moctezuma. Montezuma attempted to bribe the newcomers. He sent ambassadors to offer them gifts in the hope that they would become pleased and leave. However, the gifts, especially gold, only made the strangers more eager to visit him. Montezuma then instructed his ambassadors to provoke the people into killing the Spanish while they were admiring the gifts and feeling hospitable. However, the plan backfired. Instead, Cortes incited Montezuma's subjects against Montezuma. The Aztecs were not beloved by the tribes they had conquered. In fact, the subjugated people were the main source of the thousands of human hearts that the Aztecs sacrificed to their gods every year. In the town in Totonac, Aztec tax collectors appeared and called the local leaders to a meeting. Seeing the dejected look of the leaders after the meeting, Cortes asked Malinche what had happened. Malinche told him that the Aztecs demanded that the Totonac hand over 20 young men and 20 young women to Montezuma as a ransom for the offense of hosting the Spanish. Cortes requested the Totonac to seize and imprison the Aztecs. The local leaders, fearing Cortes more than the Aztecs, complied with his order. Though not formally on paper, Cortes had become the emperor of the Totonac, the coastal subjects of Montezuma. Instead of signing a treaty with the native ruler, Cortes was turning himself into a ruler, the next step being the lord of all Mexico. They knew how few weapons they had. They had horses and guns, but only 16 horses and 13 guns, with a few more cannons on the ships. Meanwhile, the Aztecs had thousands of soldiers, yet they had to subjugate a giant empire larger than this entire Spain. Cortes and his army marched westward, crossing mountains and ascending to the high plateaus of central Mexico. He traveled alongside Totonac warriors, people eager to retaliate against their former overlords. There were two routes to Tenochtitlan. One passed through the ancient, grand, and opulent city of Cholula. The other led through Tlaxcala territory. Tlaxcala was a federation of four mountain states, ancient enemies of the Aztecs. They shared religious, linguistic, and cultural similarities with the Aztecs, but had repelled all Aztec attempts to assimilate them into the Mexican Empire. In retaliation, the Aztecs cut off all trade with coastal tribes. The Tlaxcalans captured Cortez's emissaries. As the Spanish army approached, they immediately realized they were on Tlaxcalan land. The Highlanders gathered in a narrow mountain pass. Cortez estimated there were about 100,000 warriors. The Spanish, meanwhile, numbered at least 30,000 soldiers. The Tlaxcalan warriors carried shields, some wore padded armor, and they had wooden helmets. In terms of weapons, they wielded bows and arrows, slings for hurling stones, javelins propelled with atlatls, spears and maquahitl, a wooden club studded with sharp obsidian blades, a hail of arrows and javelins greeted the Spanish. To provoke the battle, Cortes shouted in archaic Spanish, San Diego y Alia, St. James and charge at them, and led the charge with his cavalry followed by infantry. The indigenous fighters did not flee. They pulled a Spanish horseman off his mount and bludgeoned him like an animal. Spanish arrows easily pierced the shields and armor of the indigenous warriors, but they loaded arrows much slower than the Tlaxcalan's bows. Gunfire made the indigenous hesitate, but it did not intimidate the Tlaxcalan soldiers. Cannons thundered down the narrow pass, cutting through the throngs of warriors. Eventually, the Tlaxcalan commanders ordered a retreat and the Highlanders returned disciplined as a well-drilled army. As the Spanish continued their advance a few days later, five Tlaxcalan divisions, each consisting of 10,000 soldiers, engaged them in battle. Cortes arranged archers and gunners in the front lines with cannons on both flanks. 
the musketeers, artillery, and archers would support each other, reloading and firing in turns. The Tatanak warriors were ill-suited to the ferocious Tlaxcalan onslaught, so he kept them in the rear. <laughs> the Tlaxcalan forces surged forward, and the Spanish fell to them like wheat. Till cannons from both flanks fired grapeshot, cavalry with lances and infantry with swords then pressed the attack relentlessly. Then, the indigenous contingent retreated. During the night, a Tlaxcalan officer led 10,000 troops stealthily across the plains to assault the Spanish encampment. However, nighttime attacks went against Tlaxcalan customs and they could not execute it. That night, with a full moon shining, a Spanish sentry spotted them. It seemed as if the entire Spanish force poured out and charged them. The indigenous fighters fired a few arrows and then fled. Once again, Cortez sent an envoy to the Tlaxcalans. He proposed an alliance against the Aztecs. If they refused, he would raise their cities and burn their fields. The Tlaxcalans agreed to join the alliance. While Cortez and his army were in the city of Tlaxcala, envoys from Cholula came to invite him to visit them. The Tlaxcalans warned Cortez not to go, but Cortez knew that Cholula was a necessary stop at that time. Cholula was the Mecca of Mexican Islam. Tlaxcalan scouts reported a large Aztec army camped nearby, but Cortes pressed on. Cortes and the Spanish soldiers entered the city, where they were warmly welcomed. The Tlaxcalans, historical enemies of the Cholulans, camped outside the city. The Spanish soldiers began to notice worrisome signs. Some streets in the city were blocked, and heaps of stones were piled on rooftops, ready to be thrown. They presented gifts to Cortes and held private discussions with the leaders of Cholula. Suddenly, the warm relations between the Spaniards and Cholula turned cold. Cortes befriended some leading priests in Cholula and bestowed upon them valuable gifts he had received from Montezuma. The priests, trusting in Cortes' protection, revealed to him that he and his soldiers were to be massacred in the city. The Aztecs had even prepared stakes for the Spaniards as sacrificial offerings. In a meeting with Cholula leaders, Cortes informed them that he was aware of their plot. The Aztec emissaries were fearful. They denied that Montezuma knew anything about this treacherous act. Cortes pretended to believe them, but then he positioned cannons strategically. Some aimed at the square while others were discreetly placed along the streets leading to the square. All entrances to the square were guarded by Spanish soldiers armed with spears, lying in wait until the Cholulan nobles arrived for their assembly at the square. The next morning, as the square filled with Cholulans, Cortes addressed them, revealing that he knew of their conspiracy. The Cholulans claimed it was on Montezuma's orders, but Cortes seemed even angrier that they blamed the emperor. Then the Spaniards opened fire, and indigenous warriors surged forward with swords, while soldiers with spears blocked the exits. Cholula soldiers outside the square rushed in to rescue, but they were cut down by a volley of grape shot from Spanish cannons. Tlaxcalan forces surged into the city and attacked the Cholulans from behind. Cortes estimated that 2,000 Cholulans were killed, while others put the number at $6,000. Under Cortes's orders, women or children were not harmed, but the Tlaxcalans captured many as slaves. Afterwards, he marched on to Tenochtitlan. The Spanish and their indigenous allies traveled through a pass between the two highest peaks in North America, Nistatihuatl, and the volcanic peak of Popocatapetl, standing at 5,356 meters above sea level. In the frigid high-altitude air, the Spanish army gazed down upon the Valley of Mexico, a lush green land with pristine lakes. Some cities were built on the shores, while others were entirely constructed on the water. In the midst of a lake lay Tenochtitlan. On November 8, 1519, a force consisting of 400 Spaniards and around 6,000 indigenous allies marched along the causeway leading to the Aztec capital. The causeway traversed a salty lake and was constructed with large stone slabs coated with lime mortar, wide enough for 10 horsemen to ride abreast. 
Montezuma welcomed Cortez into the palace, taking him on a tour of the city. Cortez questioned Montezuma about how a wise and noble ruler could follow a religion so cruel, worshipping deities resembling evil spirits. Montezuma's demeanor grew chilly. He explained that these gods had brought prosperity and dominion over this world to the Aztec people. He also mentioned that more sacrifices would be required for the gods, as outsiders had defiled their temples. Cortez's priests advised him against attempting to convert the Aztecs, as he had done with the Totonac people. But Montezuma's subjects became increasingly resistant. Despite reaching Tenochtitlan, the Spaniards had yet to achieve much. Therefore, Cortez requested an audience with the emperor. Subsequently, accompanied by Alvarado and a few of his most trustworthy knights, Cortez abducted Montezuma and held him in the Spanish headquarters. Cortez and his men continued treating Montezuma as a king, but the Aztec emperor understood that he was effectively living in a luxurious prison. Eventually, Montezuma summoned Cortez to his chamber within the Spanish quarters of the palace. He stated that the nation's gods had conveyed a message to the priests. If the strangers did not leave the city, they would be driven away or preferably sacrificed. Cortez replied that he would gladly depart if given boats. Montezuma promised to provide materials and labor heirs. Cortez agreed, but secretly instructed the shipbuilders to delay the construction as much as possible. He hoped to find a solution to the situation before the boats were completed. Before long, Cortez received news that the governor of Cuba had dispatched Spanish forces to arrest him for disobedience. Leaving his trusted lieutenant, Pedro de Alvarado, in charge of Tenochtitlan, Cortes led an expedition to confront the Spanish forces at the coast. So, Cortes' forces defeated the army and brought the surviving Spanish soldiers back to reinforce Tenochtitlan. Some Aztec nobles approached Alvarado, mentioning their plans for the annual festival to honor the god of war and inquired if Montezuma could join them. However, it was impossible. The Aztecs assured they would be warmly welcomed to hold their festival near the Spanish headquarters as long as they came unarmed. In truth, the Spanish soldiers also wanted to witness the festival. Alvarado contemplated repeating Cortes's actions in Cholula. However, unlike Cortes, he took no steps to verify the rumors. When the dance reached its most captivating moment, the Spanish soldiers launched an attack, slaughtering all 600 Thander, Arseki nobles. The entire Atega populace rose up, and the Spanish along with the Tlaxcalans were besieged within their palace. The Aztecs set fire to the Spanish boats on the lake. Meanwhile, Cortes was returning to Tenochtitlan when he received a message that the Aztecs had revolted. The streets of Tenochtitlan were as they were when Cortes and his men returned to the city. The Aztecs wanted all foreigners inside where they could eliminate them. Inside the palace, Cortes met Alvarado, his closest friend. He could barely contain his rage. However, he was helpless. Alvarado had the favor of the troops and was a skilled combat commander, an outstanding warrior. And the situation turned dire. The Aztecs fiercely attacked the Spanish positions, but Cortes's soldiers pushed them back. The next day, the Spanish broke through the encirclement. Barricades on the streets halted the cavalry. Spanish artillery bombarded the barricades, but more were erected behind them. Aztec warriors on rooftops hurled rocks and javelins fitted with copper, obsidian, and glass. Cortes withdrew into the palace. Later, his soldiers couldn't break the siege. Cortes requested Montezuma to address his subjects. Standing on the rooftop, the emperor told the Aztec people that the Spanish were leaving, urging them to be patient and let the foreigners depart. In response, a hail of stones descended. A rock struck Montezuma's head, inflicting a mortal wound. Immediately after, Cortes realized the Aztecs, like the Tlaxcalans, were not accustomed to nighttime warfare. He decided to quietly leave at night. He ordered his men to construct a mobile bridge long enough to span a gap on the causeway, then lift it and place it on the next gap. He chose to take the western route. It meant the army would have to take the longest route to Tlaxcala, with the shortest stretches over water. 
only three kilometers long. He instructed his soldiers to move lightly. His seasoned warriors followed the advice, but many of Narvaez's men couldn't move lightly because they carried a share of gold. On the night of July 1st, 1520, cool misty rain fell. No Aztec was seen on the streets as the Spanish and Tlaxcalans left the palace. Cortes led the main force, including artillery, most of the cavalry, and a large portion of infantry. Alvarado commanded the rear guard, mainly Spanish infantry. Finally, the Laxcolans and other allies were divided into three brigades. The army advanced along the causeway. Suddenly, the colossal drum in the war god's temple resounded, and the Spanish hurriedly pulled their mobile bridge onto the causeway to cross the first gap. Cortes and his men were halfway across the bridge, 15 or 20 abreast, when Aztecs attacked from behind. Aztec warriors in canoes lined the causeway, shooting arrows and hurling javelins at the Spanish and Tlaxcalans. Some even climbed onto the causeway's edge. When all the troops had crossed, the Spanish tried to retract the bridge and quickly place it over the next gap. However, they couldn't. The weight of the army crossing had wedged the bridge too tightly for anyone to move it. Aztec canoes were waiting at the next gap. However, many of Narvaez's men had sunk to the bottom of the lake due to the weight of the gold they carried. Other Spanish soldiers were captured by the Aztecs on the canoes, their hearts destined for the war god's altar, and their bodies used as food in the Aztec cannibalistic feasts. Spanish and Tlaxcalan warriors, who had fought when crossing the second gap, had to run between two rows of Aztec stones and arrows, then fight again when crossing the third gap. Cortes saw a fort here, then wheeled his horse around and led a detachment back to help those behind. Fortunately for the Spanish and Tlaxcalans, the Aztecs stopped plundering the corpses, acquiring plenty of loot, steel swords, shields, helmets, as well as golden gems, then massacred the desperate wounded and captured the remaining living prisoners for sacrifice. Cortes and his men reached the lakeshore and swiftly moved through the Aztec town of Tlacopan. In this chaotic land, the navigator calculated about 450 thalan out of 1,100 Spanish soldiers and 4,000 out of 6,000 indigenous allies were killed or captured. Cortes lost 46 cavalry and the number of mounted soldiers in his army dwindled to only 23. All the cannons were lost. All the arquebuses were discarded by fleeing soldiers, leaving only a few bows. Later, the road back to Tlaxcala was blocked, and the Spanish scouts spotted a very large Aztec army. Cortes organized his troops into a small, long column so the entire indigenous army couldn't surround them, and he placed a scanty cavalry force on both flanks. He instructed his infantry to aim their spears at the faces of the indigenous people and his infantry was to trust in the point of their swords rather than the edge. Then, Cortes noticed a flamboyantly dressed indigenous figure in a litter. He believed that to be the Aztec army commander, he promptly assembled his knights and Aztec interpreters and attacked the Aztec general. It was almost a repeat of Alexander's battle at Arbella. However, the Aztec general didn't flee like Darius. When he died, his army panicked and fled. Cortez's fate almost changed instantly. The next day, Cortez and the welcomed troops returned to Tlaxcala. In the days that followed, former Aztec vassals began to arrive, pledging their support to the Spanish. Cortez used his indigenous allies in conjunction with Spanish soldiers, commencing attacks from all directions on the towns where the Aztecs were stationed. Each victory brought him more alliances. Cortes had shipbuilder Martin Lopez construct 13 sailboats to sail Cortes onto Lake Texcoco, surrounding the capital Mexico City. He armed the Spanish infantry with indigenous copper-tipped spears to use alongside their swords. Once again, Cortes led his army into the Valley of Mexico. This time, Cortes advanced on each city surrounding Tenochtitlan, using sailboats that could be dismantled and brought onto Lake Texcoco. He sent envoys to Cuauhtémoc, offering peace and proposing that Emperor Cuauhtémoc would have the status of Montezuma, a vassal king under the protection of the Spanish king. Cuauhtémoc scorned and rejected the offer. 
On May 10, 1521, Cortes attack Tenochtitlan from three directions. Alvarado Sandoval and Olid commanded the three prongs of the assault, while Cortes led a division ahead along with the boats. Firstly, the Spanish destroyed the aqueducts bringing water from the reservoir on Chapultepec Hill into Tenochtitlan. Then they blocked the causeways and began advancing towards the city. The Aztecs sent hundreds of canoes to attack the Spanish and their indigenous allies on the causeways. Cortes deployed sailboats against them. The boatmen fired cannons and arquebuses at the Aztec canoes. In a short time, not a single canoe remained intact. Cortez's soldiers realized they were being impeded by widened gaps in the causeways. Behind the gaps, the Aztecs built stone barricades. Cortez could bring his boatmen and allies' canoes down and attack the Aztec defenders from the flanks and rear. However, progress for many of Cortez's troops was slow. Eventually, Cortez reached the end of the causeway. Artillery brought down the last Aztec wall and his soldiers poured into Tenochtitlan's Grand Square. The Aztecs counterattacked and captured 62 Spanish soldiers. They were using the Spanish captives as sacrificial offerings atop a pyramid while their compatriots stood guard. The Spanish advanced continuously, securing positions within Tenochtitlan. Cortes repeatedly offered peace to Cuauhtémoc, but Cuauhtémoc always refused. The Aztecs couldn't bring food into their island city, nor could they draw water from their main reservoir. The Spanish and indigenous allies advanced steadily into Tenochtitlan. Artillery brought down Aztec barricades, and firearms, along with arrows, decimated Aztec soldiers before they could get close to the invaders. Close quarter combat favored the Spanish swords. Cortes ordered his soldiers to destroy any large buildings the Aztecs could use as strongholds. By August, the Aztecs were no longer able to resist. Cortes breached the last stronghold and the Tlaxcalans, along with the indigenous allies, went berserk. Even Cortes couldn't stop the slaughter. His allies killed 150,000 Aztecs. Cuauhtémoc continued to resist on a small island until August 12, 1521, when he surrendered. Cortes praised his bravery. Cortes' conquest of Mexico was entirely unprecedented. A European power had crossed the ocean and conquered another civilization. Him, before Cortes, Europeans had been content with establishing trading posts, occupying port cities, and at most claiming small islands inhabited by indigenous peoples. Several generations of Portuguese had done so in Africa and India. The Spanish had also begun this work in the Caribbean. However, after Cortes, they began to conquer and subdue the mainland. Alvarado, emboldened by Cortes, conducted a bloody conquest through the Mayan kingdom of Chiapas in Central America, earning recognition as a conquistador, a Spanish conqueror, of Central and South America. Francisco Pizarro led an audacious expedition to Peru and, through luck, conquered an empire even larger than Mexico. The success of the Spanish led other Europeans to the Americas, Swedes, Dutch, French, and English. The Portuguese succeeded in revolutionizing trade in the Old World. Meanwhile, the Spanish succeeded in creating a new world. They also created a new trade route the route across the Pacific Ocean. Alvarado's final expedition was to cross the Pacific to the West Indies. Unfortunately for Alvarado, he delayed the expedition to rescue a besieged Spanish officer in the Jalisco state of Mexico and was killed. However, a generation later, the Spanish would traverse the Pacific like a shuttle between Mexico and the Philippines. The New World had integrated with both sides of the Old World. On the American continent, two major civilizations flourished from the vast and pristine lands of Central and South America. These were the Aztec and the Maya, two peoples with unique histories yet deeply rooted similarities. Hence, many have wondered if the Aztecs and the Maya were merely different names for the same civilization. Of course, the answer is no. They were two entirely distinct peoples with many differences. However, perhaps the numerous similarities and resemblances between them have led many to this misconception. Both the Aztecs and the Maya inhabited diverse geographical regions, 
ranging from mountains to valleys and along the coastlines, which influence their ways of life and cultural developments, or even interactions, trade, and mutual learning. A particularly notable point shared by both cultures is the development of a complex and diverse religious system. Both the Aztecs and the Maya believed in a rich religious pantheon with deities and spirits of nature, which they worshipped through rituals and festivals. This religious worship was not only a part of their daily spiritual life, but also influenced their architecture, art, and even their decisions on social and political matters. Furthermore, both civilizations also placed emphases on art, craftsmanship, and agriculture, with advancements in sculpting, painting, lacquerware, weaving, and distinctive water management systems. These artistic products were not only expressions of creativity, but also represented important aspects of their culture and traditions. Both civilizations possess a rich treasure trove of mythology and religious traditions. These stories are often passed down orally through generations and help shape and uphold the values and beliefs of the community. Their gods also share similarities in culture, such as deities related to life like the sun god, moon god, gods overseeing the deceased, rain god, an agricultural god. This is understandable as, in their era, life was intertwined with survival battles and food primarily sourced from agriculture. They needed to worship the gods they believed directly influenced their lives. They were both devout believers and willing to do anything for the powerful gods, including gruesome blood sacrifice rituals. Both the Aztecs and the Maya believed that their sacrifice rituals would appease the gods and receive divine blessings for a good life and bountiful harvests. They spared no one in their sacrifices, offering healthy individuals of all ages, from adults to children, from men to women. Of course, there are some differences in the rituals of the two civilizations, such as the Maya sacrificing by pushing offerings into a well, while the Aztecs publicly executed and offered the still beating hearts of the victims to the gods. Over hundreds of years of development and evolution, both civilizations have created world-class architectural and artistic masterpieces, reflecting their creativity and deep religious spirit. In the realm of architecture, both the Aztec and Maya civilizations constructed a magnificent and unique structures, showcasing their power and authority. The pyramid temples of the Maya and the temples and palaces at Tenochtitlan of the Aztec are the clearest evidence of their architectural prowess. These structures often feature complex architecture with tall pyramids and large buildings, demonstrating the grandeur and might of the empires. Both civilizations had large pyramids and were intricately decorated based on their religious beliefs. The purpose of their construction was also rooted in worshiping powerful gods and conducting important rituals there. Not only in architecture, but also in art, the Aztec and Maya captivated hearts. Both civilizations adorned their structures with sculptures, murals, and statues depicting gods, historical events, and important religious symbols. These artworks were often presented with elaborate techniques and vibrant colors, creating a unique and exquisite artistic tapestry. In the field of pottery art, both civilizations developed rich and diverse ceramic art. They used ceramics to create products ranging from everyday utensils like bowls and vessels to religious statues and images. The design patterns on ceramics often evoke a sense of nature and religion, symbolizing the creativity and deep religious spirit of the people. Even if you know nothing about the cultures and religions of the Aztec and Maya, their calendars bear a striking resemblance at first glance. They are unique compared to other calendar systems around the world in that each calendar is formed from two different cycles, the 260-day cycle. The first cycle in both calendars consists of 260 days divided into 13 months, each with 20 days. These 260-day cycles are mostly of religious and ritual significance as they do not correspond to seasonal changes in Mesoamerica. The Aztec called their 260-day cycle Tonal Pohuali, while the Maya referred to their cycle as Tzolkin. The 13 months are numbered from 1 to 13 instead of being named. However, the 20 days in each month were named after specific natural elements, animals, 
or cultural objects. This contrasts with the European convention of numbering days and naming months. They named days quite similarly, revolving around objects in their daily lives such as wind, rain, fire, or animals like dog, monkey, deer, eagle. The other two cycles of both the Aztec and Maya calendars are respectively called Shuch Pahwali and Hab. Both are 365-day calendars, making them astronomically accurate, like the Gregorian calendar of Europe and other calendars used worldwide to this day. The 365-day cycle. The 365-day cycles of Zhupahwali Hab are not marked by religious signs or ceremonial use. Instead, they are used for all other practical purposes. Because these cycles follow the seasons, both the Aztec and Maya use them for agriculture, hunting, gathering, and other season-dependent tasks. However, unlike the Gregorian calendar, the Shu Pawali and Hab calendars are not structured similarly. Instead of being divided into 12 months of approximately 30 days each, they are divided into 18 months of exactly 20 days. This means that each year the two cycles have five leftover days that do not belong to any month. Instead, they are called nameless days and are considered unlucky in both cultures because they are not associated with any revered or protective deity. For leap days or leap years, they would be considered as non-leap days. Shupahwali as well as Hab do not have such a concept. Instead, the five nameless days simply extend for about six extra hours until the beginning of the first day of the new year. Both the Aztec and Maya use symbols to mark the 20 days in each of the 18 months in their calendar systems. Like the 260-day cycles of Tonalpahuali Triazolcan above, these symbols were of animals, deities, and natural elements, since both calendars include both a 260-day cycle and a 385-day cycle, they also have a century of 52 years called a calendar round. The reason is quite simple. After 52 years in a 365-day year, the Shupawali Hab and Tonalpawali Tzolkan cycles realign with each other. Every five 52-year cycles in a 365-day year in both calendars, the 73rd year of the religious cycle of 260 days also passes. On the first day of the 53rd year, a new calendar round begins. Coincidentally, this is somewhat close to the average lifespan, slightly higher than average, of a human being. To make the matter a bit more complex, both the Aztec and Maya count 52-year cycles, not just by number, but by combining various numbers and symbols that will match each other in many different ways. Although both the Aztec and Maya had a concept of this cycle, the Aztecs certainly emphasized it more. They believed that at the end of each cycle, the sun god Huitzilopochtli would battle his siblings, the stars, and his sister, the moon. And if Huitzilopochtli did not receive enough nourishment from human sacrifices during the 52-year cycle, he would lose the battle, and the moon and stars would destroy their mother, earth, and the universe would have to start anew. The Maya did not have such a prophecy, so for them, the 52-year calendar round was just a period of time, much like a century for us. Although the Aztec Empire collapsed centuries ago, what the Aztec people left behind for posterity in terms of culture, art, architecture, agriculture, and religion is a treasure trove of knowledge that we still struggle to fully understand today. Nahuatl language. The Nahuatl language, part of the cultural heritage of the Aztec people, still exists and thrives in some communities in Mexico and Central America today, especially in rural areas and traditional communities. Despite undergoing various changes and influences from other languages, Nahuatl still maintains its vitality and importance within its community. Speakers of Nahuatl often use this language in their daily communication, from conversations with family and neighbors to participating in traditional events and ceremonies. Nahuatl also has a presence in contemporary culture, appearing in literary works, music, and art. Many authors, musicians, and artists have chosen Nahuatl as a creative language to express their love and pride for their cultural heritage. Although faced with declining numbers of speakers and the risk of being forgotten, efforts are being made to preserve and promote the use of Nahuatl.
Organizations and community groups regularly organize classes and events to encourage learning and usage of the language, while keeping it alive and thriving among younger generations. Architectural Temples and Cities Today, the architectural ruins of temples and cities of the Aztecs remain attractive destinations for tourists and history researchers in Mexico and neighboring regions. These sites are not only evidence of the civilization's development and rich cultural heritage, but also symbols of the power and importance of the once thriving empire. The Templo Mayor Temple, located in the heart of modern Mexico City, is one of the most notable architectural landmarks of the Aztec people. With its towering structure and intricately carved statues and walls, this temple was a site for important religious ceremonies and sacrifices in Aztec culture. Visitors can explore archaeological sites and learn about the religious practices of the Aztec people when visiting here. Additionally, the city of Tenochtitlan, where the Aztecs built their capital on an island in Lake Texcoco, is also recreated through museums and cultural centers. Models and illustrations depicting the development of this city help tourists understand how the Aztecs built and managed this large city. Despite suffering destruction and largely being demolished by political and religious authorities after the Spanish conquest, Aztec monuments are still being carefully preserved and restored. Their presence is not only an important part of Mexico's cultural heritage, but also a source of inspiration and learning about a civilization that was both advanced and creative. Although the Aztec civilization disappeared centuries ago, their rituals, beliefs, and religion still exist and contribute to the cultural and religious landscape of Mexico and Central America. These elements are not only a part of a long-standing cultural heritage, but also symbols of connection to nature and respect for deities and souls. Aztec rituals, such as sacrifices and harvest festivals, are still organized and commemorated in some indigenous communities. But speaking of gruesome rituals, blood and human sacrifices have been strongly recognized by communities and ended these cruel events. Nowadays, when talking about sacrifices and harvest festivals, they often come with activities such as dances, music and performances, along with performing traditional rituals like burning incense and offering sacrifices. The purpose of these ceremonies is often to pray for bountiful harvests, protection from disasters, and to honor the gods and ancestors. The beliefs of the Aztecs are also preserved and practiced in some communities. Belief in gods and spirits such as Quetzalcoatl and Huitzilopochtli is still an important part of the spiritual life of some indigenous peoples. Respecting and praying to these gods is often done through traditional ceremonies and festivals. The religion of the Aztecs, although influenced by other religions such as Catholicism and folk religions, still holds appeal and power within the community. Combining Aztec customs and traditions with other religious elements creates a diverse and rich religious landscape. Over the centuries of existence, the Aztec Empire has been an important part of the history and culture of Central America. From its inception in the Mexico Valley to the powerful development of the capital city of Tenochtitlan and then the painful end at the hands of the Europeans, they have left a deep mark in the minds of humanity. Even though the Aztec Empire has collapsed, their heritage still exists in ancient relics and in the traditions and arts of their successors. The grandeur of the temples and architectural structures, the power of religious rituals, and the diversity of art and culture continue to inspire future generations. Today, as we look back, the Aztec Empire is not just a story of the rise and fall of an empire, but also a symbol of the strength and resilience of a people. They explored and discovered, they built, and they endured. Although no longer existing in its classical form, the Aztec Empire still lives on in the hearts and spirits of modern people, an indispensable part of human heritage. What do you think about the Aztecs? Does their life stay with you at all? Please leave your opinion below in the comments section. And don't forget to press the subscribe button to support and follow my next videos. Thank you for your attentive listening.